Okay, hello guys. Uh, this is the first episode of my podcast, which I'm not sure how, how I will name it, but I will have a name uh, later on. Uh, today I have my very first guest on my very first podcast episode. Uh, his name is Roko Jelavic. Um, we have met because he was a Miri uh, X event organizer, and if you're wondering what Miri X is, it's Machine Intelligence Research Institute uh, X, and I think X stands for independent, or I'm not really sure, uh, but yeah, it's <laughs> it's true. And uh, so we met because I had an interest in artificial general intelligence and I was really fascinated by it. And I'm from Croatia, so I looked up, you know, anything related to artificial intelligence in Croatia and I found Rocco. And uh, this background noise, we're actually sitting in a cafe, you know, this, this is our recording uh, studio, uh, basically. And um, so I'm just going to let Rocco introduce himself uh, really briefly, and then we're going to cover some other topics. Here you go, Rocco. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rocco Jelovic. I'm a software developer. Uh, I graduated... Uh, six years ago, 2014, uh, in Zagreb, and uh, then I worked in Ericsson as a team lead, uh, leading a team of eight people on one uh, software development project. Uh, after that, I worked on some projects which were applying machine learning to some uh, problems in the telecom industry, uh, and uh, now I'm working uh, on, uh, in, uh, I'm working together with one uh, company which is uh, building some uh, blo- uh, some cryptocurrency uh, projects. Uh, uh, so that's it. Okay, and so what I want to ask you uh, is about your. Actually, I want to ask you about the, your employment in uh, in the machine learning. You, you mentioned something, solving some problems with machine learning. So if you could just elaborate a little bit of what that entailed, what did you do, etc. Uh, well, yeah, that uh, one project which I could mention is uh, we were trying to do anomaly detection on some uh, nodes in the network, uh, 4G, 3G, uh, it doesn't even matter. <laughs> we had some uh, parameters and then uh, doing anomaly detection on that. Uh, but I can't go into too, into too much details, <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay. okay, and so uh, basically the next thing I want to ask you is about blockchain. Uh, you probably can't talk a lot about what you're actually doing because it's probably also confidential. But maybe you can uh, actually just say a little bit about your thoughts on blockchain because re- just recently I I just installed Twitter basically about three weeks ago or something like that and I found a tweet from Naval Ravikant and if you if you're not sure who he is he's a uh, he, yeah he's an Indian entrepreneur I, I think he's Indian I'm not really sure but he's a very very successful entrepreneur and he basically said that blockchain will replace networks and i'm currently just listening to a college course titled distributed ledgers i think something like that if you translate to english and so i just want to know you know as someone who's working in in that area professionally what's your opinion on the technology itself and will it really change the world do you see the potential uh well uh, I see the potential, yes, but uh, maybe my vision is a little bit different than people usually have uh, around blockchains. So, uh, usually what a lot of people talk about when they are trying to uh, popularize the blockchain technology is uh, payments and uh, using uh, some kind of cryptocurrency to replace uh, traditional money. And uh, that could happen in the future, but I think that that's uh, far future, that very far in the future. Uh, so during our lifetimes, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know what probability I would assign to that. Uh, not very high. <laughs> uh, but uh, there's a lot of potential. Uh, for example, with Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin replacing uh, gold as a store of value uh, could be w- really valuable to a lot of people who don't have access to gold uh, and need something which is more uh, 
uh, easily transportable and uh, cannot be seized by different uh, totalitarian governments and so on. Uh, and also uh, there is uh, some hope uh, in the Ethereum uh, community or some other uh, blockchain which uh, enables you to write smart contracts. Uh, that opens up a lot of uh, new possibilities in uh, mechanism design. Uh, uh, so mechanism design is one uh, part of economics, uh, area of economics, which uh, is uh, similar to game theory, but in reverse. It's asking the question of how could you design some system which would incentivize some behavior which is desirable. So you want, you are asking the question of how to design a system which will make the, all of the agents cooperate together in an efficient way. Uh, so traditionally that, uh, that is done uh, through regular contracts and using the uh, government institutions uh, such as uh, courts, the police, of course, uh, and the regulators uh, and politicians uh, and so on, but that process is uh, limited in many ways and uh, using, uh, using uh, blockchains, maybe some other kind of organizations, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs, for example, uh, could be uh, could be established, but uh, that's still very early in the making. Uh, so far, uh, there have been some interesting projects, to me personally at least, uh, like uh, implementing prediction markets on the blockchain. That's also prediction market is uh, one quite interesting uh, institution, <laughs> which is hard to implement. Uh, uh, without using the blockchain, it could be done, but uh, on, on the blockchain it, it, it's it's a little bit easier, I think. Uh, well, uh, not sure about that, but in any case, it it it, it probably could be done on blockchain uh, in in the future. But but currently, it has not. Uh, it has not uh, become uh, really popular, and uh, the scaling is uh, the largest issue there. Uh, so. That, that, that's more or less <laughs> my opinion right now. Okay, yeah, great, great to hear uh, from someone who actually implements this technology. Um, yeah, I mean, I also think that like replacing money is very, very far off, but some of the applications you just talked about are, I think, a little bit more relevant. But I also think that blockchain is, like, as a technology, super young, and it's really gonna take a lot of time. And again, this is just coming from somebody who basically it's just halfway through a college course so my level of knowledge is like 0 0.001 but uh i really i really yeah i mean some applications i just can't even imagine how blockchain would help in doing some stuff you know and and so for me that's like you know like blockchains will will replace networks i kind of you know that tweet from Naval. I was like, okay. I mean, maybe that's possible, but with some things, I just can't imagine uh, some blockchain which has the ability to replace the network. Um, and so, for me, that's that's a little bit. Can you elaborate on that a bit, if you if you have? Uh, yeah, I can't. Uh, I can't speak for Naval. I don't know what uh, he was. Uh, <laughs> he meant by that. Uh, but in general, there's a lot of hype around blockchain, and a lot of uh, things are being promoted which make no sense at all, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and uh, so you you need to take everything with a grain of salt. Uh, but uh, and and the scalability is the largest issue. So w when you when you see some project uh, which is claiming to use blockchain to solve X, first you need to ask yourself: Can X be solved by using a database? And uh, if you're worried about uh, immutability or something like that, ask yourself. Uh, do we already have some cryptographic primitives uh, like digital signatures uh, or whatever which uh, which can also solve that problem and in the majority of cases the answer is yes uh, so once you have a database and you know how to use basic cryptography then uh, in majority of cases you don't need blockchain 
what blockchain is very useful for is for uh, some some things which uh, needs to be public for example uh, uh, currency and store of value uh, with Bitcoin being uh, a store of value currently because it cannot uh, it cannot scale to a lot of transactions per second. It's very limited, uh, so it's a store of value. But some, maybe some other cryptocurrency will be used for payments a little bit more. Uh, so okay, Th those two cases, uh, you need to have something which is public, uh, which is not privately owned by some company. Uh, because if some company has all of the money supply, that that just doesn't work. Uh, but in a lot in a lot of cases, uh, you 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 don't need uh, your data to be to be public. And if you can do it with the company in a closed system uh, efficiently, then uh, that that that. Uh, doesn't need blockchain in my opinion uh, but maybe some parts of uh, like for example uh, our private data uh, could be managed somehow on the blockchain instead of for example Facebook owning our pictures maybe that could be done uh, but I don't, I don't see how right now but that's a task for the developers and the engineers to think <laughs> about that uh, but that could be that could be nice uh, so uh, what, what's also really uh, interesting is that um, like the blockchain uh, and the smart contracts they offer uh, they, they, they offer some new ways to build uh, institutions and contracts. Uh, so you have your, your space of your possible uh, coordination mechanisms let's call it that is larger so now you're able to build something which was you, you were not able to build before you have a larger uh, space of all possible uh, like designs uh, for some institution and then you need to uh, find something new which is really valuable uh, and uh, that remains to like that that's that's an ongoing progress and uh, people are working on on stuff like that so we will see okay yeah so i just got interested when you just mentioned smart contracts or uh, something along those lines could you elaborate a bit how um, you know, what's the concept about? So how does the smart contract work and how does it relate to, to a blockchain? And maybe if you could contrast it with like coins, uh, you know, when you have uh, a cryptocurrency, uh, which is basically, if I'm getting this correctly, uh, if you have a blockchain and you have a cryptocurrency, which I think are inseparable, yeah, uh, then you have uh, basically you have some coins and then whoever owns the coin can spend it and so blockchain is essentially just this large chain of uh, coins pointing to one another and people using them and basically when somebody spends a coin he adds that transaction to the blockchain and then when somebody reads the blockchain he can like literally see all of the transactions that ever happened uh, and basically in blockchain only did uh, uh, like it, it's basically just stores okay I spent five Bitcoin and then somebody else takes that uh, and says you know okay that Bitcoin he uh, that five Bitcoin I received I'm spending it at something else and so I think I have a fairly good grasp of that but I don't really understand how smart contracts work we're actually just about to learn this but I'm excited to, to, to know how it works so if you could just elaborate on that a bit uh well uh just uh just to uh mention <laughs> to clear one uh, more thing up i am in my uh in my work i'm actually not working on developing some new cryptocurrencies or i'm not working with uh, solidity which is ethereum's uh smart contract uh, programming language uh, what what i'm working on is more like uh all of the stuff around the blockchain so i'm working with blockchain but not developing new capabilities of the blockchain i'm just using it uh, so i don't know all the technical details behind that uh, but from w w what i do know is that uh, 
basically with the smart contract you have a programming language which is Turing complete uh, like any other uh, standard programming language today uh, and you can run that programming language in a virtual machine uh, that virtual machine is uh, distributed uh, it is a part of the blockchain so more abstractly speaking uh, like including Bitcoin and everything else which uses blockchain, uh, what, uh, what happens is uh, you have some state of the whole system. Uh, the system is comprised of, for example, users and uh, some currency, Bitcoin and users which are the public uh, keys. And then you have uh, some other state which, like the previous state, gets up updated into a new state. Uh, and you have a, se a, a series, a sequence of updates of the internal state. Uh, and uh, one state is that uh, user A has X coins, <laughs> user B has Y coins, and so on. So that, that table comprises a state, let's say. So that's what, the, uh, that's what blockchain does, it updates the state. Uh, well, the computer also is in some state the memory of the ram of the computer or the virtual machine also is in 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 some state and it gets updated uh, so uh, you could see some how you could uh, you could come up with an idea like let's make a virtual machine which is on the blockchain all you need all you need to do abstractly speaking is to update the memory of the virtual machine from one state to another state to another state and so on and you need to verify that each update is in accordance with uh, what is actually being run on the machine like the programs which are being run uh, and and uh, so so using Solidity Ethereum's programming language, you could uh, uh, write some program, and what you could do is uh, transfer money in that program. So you have some procedure call, or uh, you, you call some function, whatever, and that function can transfer money around. Uh, depending on some conditions, if, for example, Kickstarter. Uh, you create some object and uh, people can use that uh, to transfer money uh, to it. So a really simple script uh, would be like just transfer this amount of, of money from me to somebody else. Uh, and you can do that, but that object which you are, you are uh, filling up with money actually will not uh, execute the transaction unless uh, let's say 1000 Ethereum is collected uh, in the next uh, week or so. So you can have an if condition. Uh, depending on some condition, actually uh, the money will be, take, will be taken permanently from your account. Up until then it's for example locked uh, some, uh, in some state which nobody can access it. But if, if, the, if the campaign, if the Kickstarter campaign, uh, so not exactly Kickstarter but something like Kickstarter which is running on blockchain, if the campaign succeeds uh, then uh, they have the money. If it does not succeed, you will get your money back. And you don't need to implement all of the backend uh, for that uh, like you would usually do in Python and uh, using uh, the database and uh, a, lot of, a lot of code on the backend. You can have a very simple uh, uh, smart contract. Uh, so that's how I, I see it, although I did not uh, actually write any smart contracts ever. I, this is just based on my uh, limited understanding of the technology. Okay, yeah, thank you uh, for explaining that. So I now want to transition into AGI, which is a shorthand for Artificial General Intelligence which is what I mentioned in the introduction. So me, me and Rocco met actually because of the event from Machine Intelligence Research Institute. And uh, I actually just wanted to ask him, you know, how, how did he get into AGI? 
basically and uh, you know what are his thoughts about the future of AGI so you can you know first start with how you get into it and now you know how do you see AGI going in the future are you like some doomsday prepper guy like oh AGI is gonna kill us all let's all get in a bunker and pray <laughs> you know maybe maybe you're kind of like that I mean so I, I just really like to know uh, your current thoughts and how you get into it uh, well <coughs> Uh, that's kind of a long story. <laughs> uh, I'll uh, give a shorter version of it and then, then maybe we can expand. Uh, so, uh, kind of my, my interest in AGI uh, uh, was uh, more of a product of a more general interest in trying to find out how the world works uh, actually and how did that start? Uh, well that started uh, somewhere around when I was 18 uh, or 19, uh, finishing high school and going into college. Uh, well, then the new atheism was really popular and I encountered some um, arguments against the existence of God or against believing in, in uh, the existence of God. And I was really convinced by Bertrand Russell's, uh, Russell's uh, Tippett argument. Uh, I, I remember that uh, vividly, uh, reading that on Wikipedia and just being like, yeah, okay, that makes sense, so I guess I'm an atheist now. <laughs> and uh, then uh, I started to ask myself a lot of questions, like if I was able to believe in something uh, this big which was false, uh, and it turned out I was wrong, uh, then what else do I believe in uh, which is also wrong? Uh, and I started questioning everything uh, and uh, I concluded that I need to drop all of my beliefs basically <laughs> uh, and try to reconstruct them or build them in some other way uh, using uh, rational thought and logic uh, and evidence and so on. Also you need to question why do I even believe in science, why do I even believe in logic and so on. So I got into philosophy, I started reading uh, some uh, uh, some books, uh, but also a lot of that was uh, online and on Wikipedia, of course, uh, and uh, a lot of blogs. Uh, so I found uh, one blog which was actually a community blog. Uh, it was something in between Reddit and the blog. So <laughs> it had it looked a lot like, like Reddit, but it did not have any other posts. All of the posts were uh, written in words. Uh, like on Reddit, you can have a post which is like the original. Uh, poster uh, writes up some essay, for example, and submits it to Reddit. It was something like that, so uh, that was called Less Wrong. Uh, Less Wrong, uh, that was a community of people who were trying to do the exactly same thing which was, I, uh, which was my goal. So my goal was to build a, a more correct uh, a picture of the world uh, using rationality. Uh, and uh, they were really interested in uh, all of the ways that your mind can deceive you and uh, how you could be biased in some subconscious ways and trying to correct for that. They were researching uh, cognitive science, how do people actually form beliefs uh, and uh, what, what biases exist there, like cognitive biases. Uh, and. Uh, uh, also, they were writing a lot of, about artificial intelligence and a lot of people there were thinking that AI, especially once it gets really advanced, once it gets to the uh, human capability level, so that would be the level uh, when the AI could, in theory, like do everything which humans can do. So. Uh, if you find some activities that some human can do, this AI can also do that. Uh, that's hum that would be human level or or above, <laughs> like like that. Once it gets to that level or above, uh, then uh, uh, it would be, it would get really dangerous. And my first reaction was that this is crazy talk. This doesn't make any sense. I did not <laughs> I did not see uh, how that could be the case. Uh, the arguments which were presented uh, were not convincing to me. Not really. Uh, I didn't understand them. Uh, so I just uh, 
was interesting in the rationality aspect of it, not so AI. But then uh, in uh, 2014, Super Intelligence by Nick Bostrom came out, and uh, then finally there was a book which was talking about the issue of AI, of AI AGI. Uh, and uh, I decided to read it because now finally I will see all the arguments in one place. Uh, I was hoping uh, they would be explained in a way which could be understood uh, uh, easily. And uh, really, the book blew me away. It was it was ama it, it is an amazing book, uh, and uh, I was I was convinced uh, from then on because uh, Nick Bostrom did a wonderful job with explaining a a everything about that problem and it's really watertight you cannot find I was trying to attack his position uh, and I could not attack it any in any way it just makes sense uh, so then uh, I said so I guess they were right all along about the AI stuff uh, so I tried to get involved with that and I was especially uh, like frustrated with the way that people were talking about the the issue uh, online and also in the like newspapers or uh, internet uh, portals, uh, whatever, uh, e everywhere in the public sphere uh, where I could see any discussion of the issue of AGI, a lot of uh, incorrect uh, things were being said. Uh, and uh, no, it seemed to me like nobody or, or, or very few people <laughs> I mean, uh, understood uh, Bostrom and what the, actually the position really is and why AI is dangerous and so on. Uh, so I was, I was uh, involved in popularizing uh, that idea. Uh, I held a talk about that uh, in uh, the on the uh, Zagreb University Faculty of uh, uh, Electrotechnics and uh, Computer Science. Uh, I'm, that's not the official term, but I forgot the English uh, name. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, the university in Zagreb, the Computer Science Department, they have the uh, like a class on AI, and uh, I did a talk there uh, together with Mario Bricic. Uh, and uh, also did a talk in Vienna and Hong Kong uh, on that topic. Uh, but since then, uh, uh, Elon Musk also uh, started talking about it, and Bill Gates and uh, a lot of other people. So it got popularized really well uh, from then on. But in the early days, it was really, really, uh, really frustrating and uh, and nobody understood what those guys were talking about. And uh, when you would say that uh, AI could be dangerous, AI could kill us all, like people would think you're insane or something. <laughs> it was not. It was not. Uh, <laughs> uh, not very, very well accepted. Like, uh, and also people were thinking like that only idiots who can't program a computer think that AI is dangerous. Real experts know that AI actually has very limited capabilities, it's not dangerous at all, it, uh, like, AI can do anything big right now, so why are you worried? Well, that's not the question what AI can do now, the question is what it will be able to do in the future. Uh, so, uh, so, so yeah, uh, and uh, then uh, a friend and I, we applied, we contacted uh, uh, Miri, Miri uh, is, is, is the institute which Eliezer Yudkovsky founded, Eliezer Yudkovsky also founded Less Wrong, so the guys from Less Wrong, they actually founded the, 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 the institute, uh, Eliezer in particular as the leader of that whole movement, let's say, like, let's say it like that. Uh, and uh, we go, uh, got in contact with them and uh, and asked them if uh, we could somehow contribute uh, to the cause. <laughs> and uh, even though we had a little background knowledge in AI safety, AI safety as a field di uh, didn't uh, quite exist back then. There were some papers around, but uh, 
uh, very few researchers. I think like less than 10 of them, I would guess, uh, in the whole world. Uh, from then on, that changed. I think there's about 100 now or maybe more, uh, but very few people back then. Uh, and uh, we started organizing events and uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, so I think you actually gave a super great introduction to your story and how you got into this. I just want to ask one thing, which is, what do you think about philosophers in regard to AGI? Because I really think at the beginning, for example, I, I'm not sure, uh, I think Nick Bostrom, the guy you, or if, it's, if I pronounce him correctly, uh, I think he actually uh, graduated from multiple colleges. He has actually multiple degrees. I'm not sure if they're in different colleges, but multiple degrees. And one of them is in logic or something like that, mathematical logic. But I have a feeling that a lot of papers being published today on, for example, ethics of autonomous driving, you know, like if, if an autonomous car encounters an old lady on the right side and the child on the left side, which one should it kill? And you, I mean, if it has to kill, like it, it can break or should it kill the driver, something like that. And while I do think it's a worth, worthwhile debate, I just think that like those situations are going to be very very rare as very like they sh should not happen if if you know if people are rational and if like no old ladies like jump out of jump in front of a car i, I think there was uh an incident with uber recently i mean not recently but like a couple of months ago where some uh some women was uh crossing the road and uber actually um I think it killed her. Yeah, it killed her. And, uh, you know, but I mean, even a human driver uh, would kill her because the car was just driving at that, those speeds. And even if, if the human driver reacted, uh, I think the speed was so high that, you know, she would have died anyway, you know. So um, I, I don't know much about that. I, I, so I don't want to go into detail there. But I just have a feeling that there's a lot of people who are kind of uh, don't have I would say enough technical background and they're just kind of philosophizing while there's a lot of people who uh, actually contribute to the field uh, by doing some technical advancements and I think that the field has went from this philosophical thing of like maybe AI is dangerous to kind of like in the recent years I mean it's still not like not everybody acknowledges AGI that it's a threat but I think that a lot more people are kind of getting uh, the awareness of like oh it could be a threat and we're kind of seeing the shift from like philosophical uh, papers about it uh, you know where they were incredibly useful in the beginning I just I just think I see a transition now where it's like okay but how do we actually implement something because foundationally if you're going to do an AGI you're going to have to implement it so I just want to know what do you think that like the research in the recent years has shifted more towards the technical side I mean in the in the recent year because the field existed only for <laughs> I don't know for how long but yeah in like in the recent times do you think it's going to be more useful to uh, do some technical research, more philosophical research, or a blend of both. So if you could just elaborate on that a little bit, I'm curious. Uh, well, I think that we will always need uh, some philosophy in that, uh, because uh, the whole process uh, goes along something like this. Uh, first, you have, uh, first you ask yourself some questions. Uh, which questions do you ask where that's the realm of philosophy? Philosophy gives you some kind of high-level overview uh, where you can conceptually think about uh, all the different uh, the different things, ask yourself the different questions, uh, put... Uh, uh, imagine some scenarios and like try to uh, ask yourself what uh, would the AGI do in that scenario or how should it behave under these conditions and so on but then once you uh, think very high level about it that's philosophy then you need to formalize it and you need to take all of those uh, thought experiments and situations or ideas and you need to write them up uh, in some uh, mathematical way uh, and then uh, 
you uh, need to do some technical research on, on that and push that forward and that's the hardest uh, part <laughs> uh, so I guess the majority of people should be doing technical uh, work and uh, still some other people uh, need to ask new questions and uh, push the philosophy uh, harder and uh, try to find uh, some new paradoxes and some new interesting questions to ask and go maybe a level of meta further. Uh, for example, uh, Nick Bostrom had some paper about uh, should AGI research be open source or not. Uh, I did not actually read the paper, <laughs> but uh, the the whole question of it, I read some 10 pages of it, and uh, the way he was uh, he was speaking about that uh, showed that uh, yeah, it's uh, philosophy is still useful, and you still you you can always ask new questions about the research which you are doing, and. Uh, uh, Future of Humanity Institute is more uh, more on the philosophy side of things, while Amiri is more on the technical side uh, of, the, of of research. What should be the ratio between philosophers and mathematicians? Let's call them that. Uh, well, I don't I don't know. <laughs> I guess uh, I guess more mathematicians, but yeah, uh, the, that's uh, an open question. <laughs> Okay, yeah, great. So I actually wanted to ask you, uh, what are your thoughts on the future uh, about AGI? So you actually kind of led us through our history with AGI, how you got into it, etc. So if you could just um, kind of give your thoughts on where this is going, where you see it going, and what do you think are gonna be some really great developments uh, in the field? Uh, again, probably you're not, uh, like you can't predict with a crystal ball, but you know, so um, you can just like give your general opinions and as, as somebody who has been active in the field for some time. Uh, well, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, so I hope that AGI is far away. Uh, but we cannot know that and uh, there's an excellent uh, essay by Eliezer Yudkovsky on that which is called there is no fire alarm for AGI so there is no fire alarm for AGI uh, that's th that essay uh, is basically dealing with the question of how far uh, in the future AGI really is and it's uh, giving a very strong case for uh, agnosticism uh, we can't know uh, it could be uh, really far away it could be uh, in the near term also and that's the part where most people disagree but uh, it's really uh, it's really interesting that there are no uh, no good technical arguments which are see for AGI being far away like all of the people who are claiming that it's not in the near future there they seem to me it seems to me like they're relying on their intuition and uh, nowhere ha have I seen some technical analysis of that and like proving that it's impossible in the next uh, year or two or five or ten or whatever so there's some probability that it will happen in the next week or <laughs> or month or year it could also happen in 50 years in 100 and in 500 or maybe our civilization collapses before it even happens so maybe never we, we don't know uh, so yeah but that essay uh, goes in in depth on, on, on that field but on, on that question but uh, in the field of uh, uh, AGI safety or AI alignment like they call it uh, nowadays in uh, how will that field progress uh, I have no clue uh, it has more people now than before but it will it will need uh, like 10x or 100x more until it could conceivably solve the problems at least from my perspective 
Yeah, of course, it is possible that one lone genius uh, solves the whole issue, but there's a very low probability of, of that because today you have you have various calculations on that, but uh, it's around uh, 10,000 people uh, which are working uh, on AI capability research that includes industry and academia and everything. So. 10,000 people working some, on something with AI and trying to improve AI. On the other hand, you have around uh, 100 people working on AI safety. So you have a 100x uh, like difference. Uh, to <laughs> this. Uh, so two orders of magnitude, yeah. But the but the question of how to build an AGI seems to be an easier question than how to control an AGI. So you would conceivably, uh, you would need more AI safety researchers than there are, there are AI uh, researchers. So what you need to do is maybe 200 more <laughs> people. <laughs> like for each person doing AI safety, we need 200 people. Uh, well, it, it, it could be that the calculation uh, is somehow uh, does not take into account all of the parameters and so on, but, uh, but it's still, it still gives you, some, gives you some picture of the situation. Uh, and uh, also one thing which is uh, kind of troublesome is that when you are, when, when somebody is doing uh, AI safety research, uh, some of the computer science which is developed for that purpose, like you're doing AI safety and then you're proving some theorems, you are doing some computer science research, you prove some new thing, blah, blah, blah. Uh, some of that research could also be used for AI capability. So let's say, uh, let's say 10% uh, of uh, AI safety research could be also uh, beneficial to AI uh, researchers. Uh, and uh, so if you need uh, to publish like 100 times more papers on AI safety to solve the problem, once you solve the AI safety problem, you are done, you have done so much research that actually you have already solved the AI capability problem also. Uh, and uh, in that way, uh, if people are stealing your research uh, fast enough, uh, you could, uh, you, you could, it could be the case that uh, you, you're not done with safety, but you have produced so much useful theorems, so much useful mathematics and, and computer science that other people just stole it and they built an AI, which, which is the general, like AGI, general intelligence, and then you're, you're, you're done. So the, this, this question of being open source or not, uh, <laughs> or being secretive or not, it's really also important. Yeah, and I just wanted to point out, well, first thing, this is just like meta, not podcast. Uh, Rocco has run out of drinks, so he's been talking a lot, so if you want to drink, uh, you, can, you, can, you can drink it. Uh, and secondly, uh, I just want to point out a book I recently read uh, by Stuart, Stuart Russell. He's actually uh, a professor of computer science, I think, at Berkeley. And he's actually very, very prominent in the field of AGI alignment, a.k.a. AGI safety. And uh, I mean, I think that alignment is now like a sub part of AGI safety or like, you know, a branch of AGI safety. I'm not sure. But anyway, he uh, recently published a book. It's called uh, Human Compatible. And basically there he describes that if you want to have... Uh, are an artificial intelligence which is safe we can't really hope to control it because it's going to be like better than us but what we can do is we can not embed goals which are used currently in um, machine learning models so we don't actually embed uh, you know some loss function which we aim to minimize uh, but we actually say things like, okay, well, uh, you should always be uncertain about your goals so that the agent, uh, the artificial agent, actually always kind of um, 
always has a probability of not being completely certain if his actions are what a human actually wants. Uh, and again, this is just something I want to throw in. If anybody listening wants to kind of delve deeper into this, you can Google Stuart Russell, human compatible, or any combination. Uh, only if you Google human and without anything else, you probably won't get the results you were looking for. But I think that any, any combination of uh, those keywords are going to produce the book. Okay, and so right now I wanted to transition into something Rocco is incredibly passionate about. He actually has a book about it, which is open source. Uh, I mean, he's he's maybe uh, I see. Uh, so he's going to give you a little bit uh, a little bit more info on that. But I just wanted to actually. Uh, ask him about the theory of everything and from my point of view uh, you know I, from the conversations I had with him it's actually a theory which tries to unify the entire world basically it tries to explain every phenomena with uh, with some theory basically uh, and I'm not sure if I'm getting this correctly or not so I'm going to uh, hand over the microphone to Rocco and you know let him explain a, a, in a little bit more depth uh, yeah, so this uh, this is a little bit of hard to explain without actually going into the material itself, uh, but I'll, I'll give it the best shot. Uh, so uh, basically the question is, uh, if I uh, say at some point that uh, like uh, all of my beliefs may be false, so I'm not going to believe anything, let's build the whole worldview from scratch. Uh, how would you go about it and how would you do it? So uh, the first thing uh, which, <laughs> which is the most important is what actually knowledge is. What do we mean by knowledge? Uh, uh, is there some, some kind of a way, some kind of a procedure which would be uh, the best for uh, generating knowledge? Or in, technically speaking, is there an optimal algorithm for generating knowledge? Uh, so that's the first uh, question which needs to be like resolved, uh, and uh, uh, then you start you start from that, and then you, you then you build incrementally uh, further on. So, like the the idea for that uh, for that is like very long for a very long time it was in my head, but I never actually started the project. It was always something like. In the future, one day I will start to write about that and so on. Uh, and uh, it did not start as an, uh, like the idea was not. Let's take the, all of these all of these different fields and try to unify them. But it it kind of uh, evolved into that gradually. Uh, so. Uh, so yeah, you, you, you start with some very basic uh, axioms or very basic situation, like you have some data from the world around you. Uh, let's say you're some agent, you have some agents, okay, okay that agent received the data from the outside world. Uh, this data can be represented somehow as a sequence of characters or in computer science called a string. And then the question is what generated that string? Uh, and uh, as you try to answer that question, you can deduce something which is called Kolmogorov complexity, uh, which is maybe too technical to get into right now, uh, but uh, it measures the complexity of the string using uh, the length of the computer program which generated the string and so on and so then you get and you get solomon of induction which deals with the question of like what is the uh, like uh, you 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 can assign some probability to some theory for what is generated in the data and so on but as you as you go along and construct that uh, theory uh, you i started to see that a lot of philosophical questions were being answered by that uh, that concept so once you go through with the technical uh, analysis of kolmogorov complexity solomon of induction then you can see it has a lot of implications for epistemology which is epistemology is a branch of philosophy which deals with uh, knowledge uh, what is knowledge uh, and uh, 
how do we know what's true and so on. So a lot of those paradoxes from there uh, become solved actually and a lot of uh, questions from philosophy of science which deals with what is science and uh, why does it work, how it works, uh, w which theory is better than some other theory, how can we distinguish between theories like uh, which has more sense uh, and, and so on. So you also solve a lot of those problems as well. And then uh, at the at the end uh, you you get some uh, you get some uh, picture of the world which is makes it makes some sense but it also raises a lot of new questions as well. So now you have a question of why uh, why do we as people experience the passage of time uh, you as you live your life uh, you see that time is flowing in some direction it because it goes from the past into the future and actually that may sound abs absurd to someone uh, who has never pondered the question of time but uh, actually physicists uh, have thought about this uh, for uh, for a long time already, uh, as Albert Einstein uh, said, like time is an illusion, but a very persistent one. And then you uh, you, you you get into that uh, those questions in philosophy of physics, and it turns out that also Kolmogorov uh, solves a lot of those questions as well. But also the concept of cellular automaton. Uh, or, which is another computer science concept. It solves also a lot of those problems. Then you 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 get into uh, the problem with quantum mechanics. So you have quantum mechanics which works in a completely counterintuitive, like crazy way, and it doesn't fit well with our picture of the world which we have, which is based on Kolmogorov and cellular automaton and so on. But then you can uh, you you can use some another technical uh, solution for that. Then all that is also connected to quantum computers and quantum computation, and then your image of the world gets transformed once again. Uh, and once you have that, uh, then you have like the basic, let's call them ontological building blocks, and then you can say that in this world there are some patterns. What are patterns? And then again, you have a technical solution from that, from computer science, from AI. Uh, like a basic, uh, uh, basic uh, classification algorithms from machine learning tell you a lot about what patterns are and how they can be recognized. Uh, and uh, then you can also, uh, once you develop that, you, you can see that uh, actually those technical insights Insights solve a lot of the philosophy of language problems, like what are words, how do words get meaning, which, well, words are just labels we used uh, to, to label some concept, and that concept is mathematically defined through uh, a model from machine learning. Uh, uh, and uh, then after that, uh, you have all, uh, you have the subject of optimization, for example, and uh, evolution, and you can show how evolution is just another example of an optimization process, and you have also evolutionary alg uh, algorithms and so on, so you can explain evolution also in, in using algorithms. Uh, and uh, after that, what is the product of evolution? Oh, well, uh, Agents uh, is one of them, <laughs> like plants and mushrooms, but also animals, also animals which have higher cognitive functions and uh, could be called agents. And then, you ha then once you have agents, uh, they also have a lot of interesting properties, and you can uh, you can take insights from decision theory uh, to explain a lot about them, and also maybe uh, decision theory can shed some light on the question of consciousness or why do we have consciousness what is the uh, benefit of agents having consciousness and so on that's highly <laughs> experimental and uh, it, 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 it's work in the making but I think that uh, th there are some implications there, there. I just need to, to write them up uh, <laughs> in a nice way and uh, 
then uh, once you have agents and they're intelligent you can uh, you can have them interact and uh, once you have that uh, like a multi-agent systems you have you can have markets and uh, the whole uh, economic principles could be also deduced from first principles at least microeconomics and once you have that you can then talk about mechanism design and uh, coordination and game theory prisoner's dilemma how to solve that and so on so then you also have uh, you also have uh, some technical insights on how to coordinate better and maybe even uh, blockchains uh, <laughs> have something to to do uh, something to like contribute to that and maybe they 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 will also be included in the book not not because it would be cool to include blockchains but because actually they do solve some of those core like fundamental problems uh, and the basically uh, that's uh, the la the last chapter of, of of the book will probably be that, that on coordination and that is the fundamental I think most important problem in the world today uh, if anyone is interested in learning more about that I would recommend uh, a blog post Meditations on Moloch uh, Meditations on Moloch is, is the best blog post ever <laughs> in my opinion <laughs> and in the opinion of like many of, of, of my friends who, who read it uh, so uh, Scott Alexander explained there why uh, coordination is very hard to achieve and uh, why uh, on most of our problems which we have in the world today are the result of bad coordination. Uh, but uh, the, the, this book is not uh, ready yet. <laughs> it, it is uh, it is being written. Uh, but only the first chapter is uh, actually uh, presentable. Uh, the first, the first uh, chapter uh, is available uh, available online on GitHub. Uh, but the other chapters are being uh, written or developed uh, privately by me. And then once I, I will have some uh, presentable, like good uh, version of them. I will publish them uh, on the public uh, GitHub repository uh, <laughs> of the book. Yeah, well, thank you. So basically, if I understood this correctly, uh, you're actually kind of assuming nothing, that you know nothing about the world, and you build from that. And I mean, that's just really powerful, because if you think about it, if you can build the entire world from those basic axioms and build up, 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 maybe you can actually kind of go into the future if you just kind of naturally follow where it leads you. And so what I wanted to ask you, actually, two things stuck out to me. So number one is time, because I literally never pondered about, okay, why can't we go back in time? And I think I actually once, uh, in during my high school physics lessons, I watched a lecture from Richard F Feynman, uh, if I pronounced it correctly, I think it's Feynman or what, Feynman, yeah. And uh, he was actually talking that time is something like a saw or a seesaw. I don't know how you say it in English, but it basically just turns in one direction, doesn't turn in another direction. And I remember that, but I can't really remember the detailed reasoning behind time. So if you could, like, in very simple terms, explain why time flows from past to present and why we can't or not that maybe it I, I don't know if time travel is possible I, I don't know I know nothing about physics I have to like rehash my physics knowledge and like r learn some new things in physics but if you could explain about that and then also uh, about conscious but yeah let's first talk time then we're gonna talk consciousness <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, with regards to time, I'm not uh, an expert on physics and I don't uh, quite uh, uh, understand all of the technical details on that, but that's not even the point. Uh, the thing is that uh, the, the project which is called, uh, the project is called Hello World. <laughs> so the, the idea, idea being like, uh, you, 
the the the, the project explains uh, all of the things you could uh, you could come up with if you, if be, even before you encounter any uh, empirical evidence. Like if you had an AGI, AGI could understand all of all of the content of Hello World even before it gets any input from the environment. Like with its eyes closed. It could deduce that something like evolution could exist and probably exists in the universe in which the AI is embedded. It could also like deduce all of the economics uh, and uh, agents and so on. Uh, so when I talk about time, I'm talking about uh, some, uh, you could say, metaphysical ways uh, in which uh, in which the universe. Uh, like any u universe which uh, contains, uh, it's it's hard to explain like that. But any any sufficiently complex universe uh, would contain within it uh, so something like t uh, agents which are embedded in it would have a c conception of time. It's 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 not it's not a very satisfying <laughs> explanation. But I cannot go into a lot of details. But actually. It, it, the idea is that uh, time uh, does not flow at all. Uh, the, the universe is a mathematical structure, which uh, actually the time is just another dimension, like a fourth dimension in our case. Uh, so you have a four-dimensional structure. This structure just is, is there. It's there. It's standing still. <laughs> it's not moving. Uh, and uh, agents are embedded within it, uh, but in each point in time, the agents can remember the past, but they have no such knowledge of the future. This is asymmetrical, so it's interesting. Why is that the case? Uh, and also, uh, in physics, there are some things called uh, symmetries. So there is symmetry of the physical law. Physical laws are the same uh, through space and through time. Uh, this is also expected from uh, Kolmogorov and Solomonov. <laughs> uh, and uh, this this whole this whole issue of time is interesting because if uh, the physical laws are symmetrical uh, in a lot of ways uh, why is time as asymmetrical but i cannot i cannot explain it in this format it needs to be uh, a lot of example need to examples needs to be need to be given pictures uh, and it's uh, whole other podcast or a lecture or whatever <laughs> yeah okay yeah so um i just want to ask uh, about consciousness because that's also what stuck out to me was i think humans in general kind of like take consciousness for granted like you know that you're conscious and you think your own thoughts and in a way i think that's why people ask themselves like is there something after you die because maybe like your body like is dead i mean it doesn't doesn't function anymore your heart doesn't pump blood and you know whatever other things are happening <laughs> but um your consciousness just kind of leaves the body and maybe travels somewhere else um i mean some people talk about dreams but i think i mean when you're dreaming you're still kind of breathing you know you're still alive basically although your heart's pumping less like in less beats per minute it's you're still alive so i'm not you know I, i'm i haven't even thought like who gave us consciousness. i, I never asked myself that question uh or maybe i have like once but again i i haven't really thought about it really really closely so um maybe i know that you probably can't as well as with time you probably can't like go into too much detail without the examples and the pictures but can you just give us a little bit of like insight into what's consciousness as defined by the theory of everything and like what concepts kind of relate to it and maybe some examples like whatever you have throw it in uh, basically uh yeah and uh, just to just to uh, 
clear one thing up uh, that uh, theory of everything is a term uh, often used by physicists to describe a physical theory of everything uh, but this uh, uh, thing I'm writing uh, is uh, not a physical theory of everything. Uh, uh, it, it is a kind of philosophical system which comprises all knowledge uh, as such. So it's a little bit different way of using the, the term. Uh, uh, so, uh, so yeah, uh, and uh, also uh, a lot of uh, a lot, uh, I don't have uh, a philosophical theory of everything. I'm working on the theory, so uh, it's uh, like 20% done, maybe. <laughs> uh, but the, the idea around consciousness uh, was that uh, once evolution produces some agents, they have a model of the world. Uh, they are able to use their senses to like construct a picture of the world and what they experience actually and what they uh, like th this model which they have in their brain uh, the, uh, that th that model uh, is actually what they are experiencing there you're not experiencing the real world when you when you look around yourself the things which you see you see your model of the world you're looking at your model actually <laughs> and <laughs> you're not looking at the real thing. The real thing is outside and it got through your nerves and it got into the brain and then a picture is formed in the brain of course uh, and uh, the interesting thing about it is if you try to change like look around your room uh, or wherever you are and trying to change some part of the picture you will find that it's very hard, maybe impossible, even for a very short time to change any aspect of the picture. If I'm, I'm looking currently at a red table, and if I try to see that table as being blue, I can't do it. I maybe can do it for a fraction of a second, like it can be a little bit blue, but then again, reality uh, breaks through and uh, and shatters my <laughs> illusion. <laughs> uh, why, why is that the case? The, uh, the, the, the model seems to be immutable. And uh, there's actually a very good reason for that, because if you could uh, change any part of your model uh, at will, then you can imagine the best possible situation for you, whatever you would like to be happening currently, you can just produce it in your mind and it could be as vivid and as real as anything else. Uh, in that way, uh, that, that's in AI safety, that's called wire heading. That's like, uh, you, you, there was an experiment with rats when they had rats in a cage and they had some wires uh, going in the rat's brain and stimulating the pleasure center of the brain. And the rat could uh, could activate with the button, could activate uh, the, the signal uh, and it would get a lot of pleasure from uh, uh, clicking that button. On the other hand, the rat had food and water on the other side of the cage and what rats would do, they would just go to the button and press it over and over until they died of, hung of starvation. They, they would not even eat, they would just activate the pleasure center of the brain. Well, if you could imagine anything uh, and uh, have it so vividly, if, if, like, if your conscious experience of this moment was not immutable, if it was actually mutable, then you could uh, just experience uh, an infinity of pleasure all the time and die of starvation, as the Reds did. So, uh, so your consciousness is... Uh, it, it it can be it can it can be changed somewhat by, by your by your deliberation like if you're into meditation or something else it can also be changed your conscious experience can be changed by using of course uh, some chemicals uh, uh, alcohol perhaps being the most popular one uh, so yeah consciousness can be changed it's not exactly immutable but it's hard to uh, change. Uh, and uh, 
also it needs to be it cannot be ignored you cannot just you cannot just shut down uh, if you're feeling pain you can say to yourself like oh it's not actually that painful or, or you could some, somehow get used to it but not exactly you cannot block it completely you can alter it a little bit but not block it you cannot ignore it it's unignorable so it seems very real <laughs> although it's actually just a model in her head but it seems like it's unignorable it's unimmutable it's like real and you are conscious of it 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 it, it is some kind of an illusion happening there but it's very very believable <laughs> uh, and very realistic yeah because how do you know what realistic is if you <laughs> all you had was the, the the your consciousness not some other consciousness but yeah so th that's kind of the idea like the uh if, ev if evolution ever produced some agent which could uh, alter its state of consciousness at will and could ignore it, then that agent would die of starvation or, uh, or so some other... It would ignore the feedback from the environment and just be crushed and that's, that's it. So it's actually in the interest of evolution to produce conscious agents. Yeah, well, when you were discussing this, the thing that popped to my mind was actually, do you know like all of those books which are like positive thinking and whatever, you know, like think positive and you'll see better things. So yeah, you talked about like an environment is immutable and basically like things are the way they are, but I'm just, the thing that popped to my head was, okay, how does like optimism and pessimism relate to this? So, I mean, obviously, like, if somebody's optimistic, he sees some things other people see as bad, maybe not as bad, or maybe good things, you know, as really good. Uh, but I was just wondering, like, you know, I'm, I'm like a little, I'm like a high school kid with a lollipop. I was wondering, like, you know, <laughs> but, but I, was, I was wondering, uh, how does it, you know, how does this shifting your thoughts to something... I would say more constructive, which will kind of make you deal more effectively with, with losses in life and, and kind of make you more resilient. How does it relate to theory of everything? And, and this is something I, I, I just popped in my head once you were talking about it. Yeah, but anyway, uh, so I wanted to ask you, uh, I think we, we're kind of nearing the end, so I will include the link uh, I will include the link to your uh, GitHub first chapter of the Hello, uh, Hello World book in the uh, links. There, there are going to be links somewhere on the podcast. I'm not exactly sure because, again, I told you I don't even have the name for the podcast yet. This is like probably the the most underprepared for a podcast in the history of podcasting. <laughs> but, uh, but definitely, uh, you know, check out the description. If you're listening to this podcast where there is no description, then, you know, head out to my website. You're going to find it or to my YouTube channel, wherever this is going to be published. And you're going to find the description and all the links. Uh, I just kind of wrote down all of, all of the things we discussed. I think I covered them all and you're going to find the links. And uh, so, yeah, Rocco, I, this has been a very good, interesting conversation. Do you have anything to add on the end? Uh, well, uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we, uh, they, they're closing the bar in about, I think, 15 minutes or something. So I think we have about that 15 minutes. And then, you know, they're probably going to kindly ask us to leave. So, <laughs> yeah, here you go. Yeah, as, as I started to write uh, my Hello World uh, project, <laughs> which is the name of, the, of the, uh, what will one day become the Hello World book, uh, as I was writing that, I, I kind of, I was wondering uh, uh, why, uh, why, why don't we already have something like that? Like, what is the thing, <laughs> what is... Uh, what is stopping other people from trying something like that in the past? And uh, well, philosophers have tried that in the past, but uh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> to get to give some s systemized view of the world that uh, 
seems to be like a thing from the past. We don't do that anymore. No. Like now we're specialized and uh, we don't try to give a general overview. We have textbooks on various subjects, but uh, you, you can also find a textbook on physics, just the whole physics. Richard Feynman uh, wrote a textbook on physics, which he gives overview of physics. And then you have another textbook on some other area, uh, overview of chemistry by Linus Pauling and so on. Uh, overview of mathematics, I did not find that anywhere. <laughs> mathematics seems to be a little more uh, specialized from the beginning, but, but yeah, no, there's no general overview. You have a Wikipedia, uh, but on Wikipedia you have a lot of things which are not at all important. You have too much data, you can't read the whole Wikipedia that uh, you, you don't have time for. No, you would have to live for a thousand, ye thousand years or more to do that. Uh, but it seems to me like that it would be really useful to have some short uh, overview of the most important concepts and most important insights uh, which you need to have. Uh, once you once you know basics of mathematics and basics of programming like uh, first year of computer science for example once you know that you should be able to uh, understand uh, a hello world project in its entirety so it's not written for uh, high school students uh, it's not going into every single detail of everything. Uh, uh, it, it, it has some prerequisites of like uh, knowing some very basic uh, probability theory and combinatorics and uh, uh, programming. You need to know what for loops are and <laughs> if statements and uh, some, some basics. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's what I'm trying to build. I'm trying to, to to build a, a book which would uh, offer the reader like the greatest number of insights per page. It's like only the most important stuff uh, written in a really concise, uh, very direct way with examples and uh, with everything uh, being defined. Uh, <laughs> Uh, properly and with uh, code snippets for uh, I have code snippets for Kolmogorov complexity I have a code snippet which uh, if you had an infinitely fast computer it would uh, compute Solomonov induction but yeah the code is there <laughs> uh, so uh, that is the, the general idea uh, between that uh, and uh, yeah, that's all <laughs> I could think of, yeah. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for joining me uh, today. Uh, and, well, that's, I think this concludes the first episode. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, whoever is listening, thank you for listening. And I will see you or I will hear you in the next episode. Talk soon. <laughs>